How many of you in here, let me start off with a question, are gamers? Man, you, you, like, you like the game, buddy. I mean, throw your hands up. Hi, I know. Man, how many of you are Call of Duty? Yeah, how many, how many of you are Siege? Yeah, most of you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Rainbow Six Siege. Man, I love, where are my, where are my OGs at? My, my original gamers, like Nintendo, Atari, Sega. Yeah, man, that's me. And I'm back in those days with like Mario, Duck Hunt, you know, and, and uh, man, those were the days, man, where you just, you only, you really only had about an hour before your parents kicked you out of the house and you were outside the rest of the day. Uh, but man, I, I kind of graduated from like Zelda, Duck Hunt, and, and all those into, from the Nintendo over to Xbox when it came out. I really liked the Xbox, and I had a lot of games, man, and uh one time, my wife and I had decided that we were going to take a trip to Mississippi. Okay, now, I'm an older guy at this point, right? and I still have an Xbox. But uh, we traveled to Mississippi to just on a, on a whim. We were going to spend the night over in a hotel uh, and then just come back the next day. Well, we did that. We, we went over, and we came back the next day. We, we got in our house and uh, immediately knew something was off. Like, there's some drawers open, man. It was... Uh, it, was, it was hot in there. We were like, what's going on with this? And then we got a little bit further, went into our bedroom, and, man, all of our drawers have been ransacked, man, sheets all over the place, the bed everywhere. I looked in my, cor- in my closet. My guns are all gone. I'm looking for all this other stuff, and I'm like, somebody broke into our house, man, while we were gone. Somebody came inside our house, and, man, let me tell you what. I looked all around for my Xbox, and guess what? You know, Xbox there. I lost a pistol. I saw stuff. You know what I was worried about? My Xbox. (laughs) But really, honestly, I felt pretty violated. Have you ever had something stolen from you? Man, you feel violated. And I really did. I felt violated. I really didn't even know what to do. There there was no sign of the person anymore. He's gone. So we do. We call the police. Of course, they come and, you know, they they do the whole uh, check and everything. But uh, but honestly, man, in our lives, there's thievery that's going on right underneath our noses. We don't even know it's happening. The problem is that we're, we are a preoccupied people. You see, just like me, I was preoccupied on vacation. I was going to spend a night with my wife. Not such a bad thing, right? But I was preoccupied. You see, we have these things called jobs. Jobs preoccupy us. We have this thing called money. And that preoccupies us. That preoccupies our mind. And we, we're starting to think, hey, where's the next, uh, uh, where's the bill, where's the money going to come for this next bill that's coming? And man, we have activities. I just preached a wedding yesterday. My first wedding, by the way. It's made it day one so far. They haven't got divorced. So um, one and oh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we got activities like weddings. We got uh, funerals. We have birthdays. We have graduations. I mean, all these things, not necessarily bad things, but they do preoccupy our minds. And don't even get me started with social media. How often do we sit there in our chair, and I'm, this is me too, and just, whoop, whoop, or I don't know how it is. It's not like this anymore. It's like, whoop, whoop. And you just, you just read and, and scroll, and, man, time just slips away, doesn't it? Our attention, a lot of times, is so focused on all the, not necessarily wrong things, but all kinds of things, and we don't notice that the things that are really, really important slip out from underneath us, and we lose them. The enemy comes in. Our preoccupation comes in, and the enemy steals from us. So what do you do When all seems lost, what do you do when the things that matter most to you have been taken right from underneath your nose and they're nowhere in sight? Well, I believe there's only two answers to that question. One, I think, is where a lot of us are. This is where I think a lot of Christians today are. We just throw our hands up and give up. It's sad to say, but I've been there myself. I'm preaching to myself. Sometimes I just let my apathy, I let my, 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 my desire to, to be comfortable 
overrule my attention for the things that really matter. So there's two answers to that. That's your first answer. Second answer is this. It's simple. Do something about it. Just do something about it. Something's been stolen from you. You got to do something about it. Amen? You're going you're to try to find, okay, let me give you another story, all right? Uh, my truck, I love my truck. I have a 1996 Chevy Silverado, and you can't tell me that that is any worse than your 2024 Silverado. <laughs> Why? Because I don't have a payment on that thing. And it runs. And it's cute. <laughs> but <clears throat> I used to run a business, and I let uh, one of my workers uh, borrow my truck. And, uh, and I probably shouldn't have. He had a bad history of you know, drug abuse and all this other stuff. But I wanted to help him out, and, and it was for work a lot, and a lot of it was for himself. Well, he was supposed to bring my truck back uh, one night here at CCR, and, well, he did not. And so my... Uh, my instinct is, well, maybe he'll, he'll bring it back later. And, uh, you know, he never brought that thing back. And I called him, said, hey, man, where you at with my truck? <laughs> where is my truck, buddy? I need my truck. I got to work, man. No answer. I'd, I'd call. It'd go straight to voicemail. I'm like, Ugh, I'm getting burnt out. So you know what I ended up doing? I, call, I called the law. I called uh, Santa Rosa uh, uh, sheriff's department, a lady met me up at Walmart, gave her my report, and I'm like, what do I need to do? I mean, like, I need my truck. And she's like, she's like well, I mean, we'll, we'll put a, be on the lookout for your truck. She says, but honestly, you just got to sit here and wait. I didn't like that. <laughs> we didn't go home, did we, honey? I was like, we left Walmart, and I drove around every drug neighborhood I knew of in this neighborhood <laughs> trying to find my truck. And guess what? Guess who found his truck? On the side of the road in Garcon Point Road. Me. So I called the sheriff's department, told him to come over. Yeah, I did something about it. I didn't just sit there. I couldn't just sit there. I had something that was very valuable to me that I needed to have. Something that was crucial to my family's life. It was my livelihood. That truck was my livelihood. I, if I didn't have a truck, I am not pulling a 10-foot enclosed trailer full of tools with a Ford Focus, okay? It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, I could go for a little while, but I'll, you know, you get the point. Pastor Joel last, last week uh, preached about some giants that cripple us in our life. Talked about the giant of fear. And man, that cripples us. He talked about the giant of rejection. Man, that cripples us too. He talked about the giant of anger. But I think what really gets us, what really cripples us, is the giant of comfort and complacency that he talked about. Well, we don't do anything about the giant that's in our life. We don't do anything about the enemy when he comes in and robs us of the joy and the contentment that we have in Christ. We just throw our hands up. Oh, well. Oh, well. I'm not strong enough to fight it. You might be saying, listen, I, I, this, I'm too far gone. I'm too addicted. I'm too busy. I, I have too much stuff going on. Can I tell you that that's a lie? That's what the enemy wants you to believe? He wants you to believe all those things. But can I tell you, you're not too far gone. You're not too addicted. You're not too far away from hope. Can I tell you that there's a God that works on your behalf? If you just call on him and call on his name today, he will help you. He will help you take back what the enemy stole. That's the name of our, our lesson today, our, our sermon today. And you might recognize the name of that. Uh, that is a song uh, by Torn Wells called Take It All Back. And, uh, man, I tell you, when I was at the first of the year, I started this thing called 75 Hard. And it's a strict exercise diet regimen. You got to work like crazy to get this thing done. And, uh, man, that was my, my theme song through the whole thing. Take it all back. The enemy had stolen something from me that I wanted back. He stole my health. I was at 215 pounds. At the start of that, I'm here today at 190. So why? Because I wanted something. I decided I was going to take back what the enemy had stolen from me. 
And so every single day on repeat, I would, I would listen to that song as I jogged, as I worked out. Taking back what the enemy stole. You say, but how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, I believe today, if we're going to look at our, our text, it's going to give us the answers that we need. But a little bit of context. Listen, I, the only reason I had you read chapter 29 is so that you can come to chapter 30 and, and follow along with me here. You can get the backstory of what's really happening. You see, David has been hiding in Ziklag for a year and four months away from Saul. David, he has 600 men with him and all of their families. And at this point in time, the Philistine army has gone out to battle against Israel and against Saul in that last battle that Saul will ever fight. And David's coming right behind him. And the lords of the Philistines say, no, we don't want him. He's going to turn on us, and he probably would have, and kill them. But he to they told Achish, that king uh, uh, Ziklag, or the Philistines, you need to go back, David. We don't want you here. As David leaves... And comes back. Let's look at what happens in verse number 1 of chapter 30. <clears throat> it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great nor small, but carried them away and went on their way. Now, I don't know about you, but that would have devastated me. Coming back to your home city, it's entirely burnt to the ground, nothing but ashes and smoke rising up. There's no bodies. There's nothing. It's burnt buildings. It's rubble. David looks. His wife's not there. All of the kids gone. The enemy had come in and stolen and taken captive all of the families of David and his men. In verse number three, it says, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever been to the point in your life when you have cried so much? You have cried so much, you cannot cry anymore. I've been there. You imagine the anguish that they must have felt to have everything ripped away from you in a moment. This pain was so great that it showed itself in audible form. Would you look at verse number six? And David was greatly distressed. The Bible says David was greatly distressed. That word distressed literally means to, to be pressed to be shaped out of shape or into a different shape. I've spent some time as a business owner knowing a little bit what stress is. Okay? I've, I know what stress is. Matter of fact, I've come to the point at some points in my life where I would come home, and you can ask my wife, I would come home, I would, just, I would immediately go right to the couch, and I would just curl up in a little ball because of the stress that was on my life. I was greatly distressed. David wasn't just stressed, was greatly distressed. And why? Look at verse number six again. David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. And the men were grieved. And you would be too. You came back to your city and all of, your, all of your, your belongings, your houses, your families are gone, destroyed. The enemy's taken them. And who do you blame? They blame David. 
But why did they blame David? You see, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 27, verse 1, the Bible says that David trusted his heart. He said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me no more in the coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. You know what David was doing? David was trusting in his own heart. And as a result, David led his people wrongly. He led them into the hands of the enemy. And these men understood it. Everything had been taken from them. His poor leadership had brought them to this point. And all of this led to a point in David's life where he had to make a decision. He was either going to succumb to the apathy and discouragement and maybe even death, or he was going to do something about it. As we're going to see, David chose to do something about this situation. The first thing that David did and what should be the first thing that we do when we find ourselves in a, in a ziklag moment like David was, was number one, we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Look at verse 6 again. He said, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. And that word encourage is the, is the Hebrew word uh, chazak. And it literally means to seize, to grab hold tightly, to refrain or support by grabbing a hold. Listen, David, David knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly what brought him to that point. He understood the distress. Imagine when he's thinking about all of these things that had happened to, his, to this city and to all of his uh, men and their family and his family. He's thinking about, man, I did this. And now people are speaking about stoning me. I've brought myself to this point. I'm the one to blame. And you know what David did? David went to God. He encouraged himself in the Lord. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know how far you're gone. I don't know what your sin has done to you in your life. But can I tell you, God is the one you need to turn to. It's not anything that you could ever do. First of all, you got yourself in the situation. God is the one that will get you out. David went to uh, encourage himself in, in the Lord. And I want you to know, understand this, too, that there's an enemy out there, and his number one tool is discouragement. Discouragement paralyzes determination. There's nothing you can do when you are paralyzed by discouragement. Satan uses that more than anything. He uses people and circumstances to discourage us from being what God wants us to be. He uses doubts and fears to discourage God's people from trusting in his promises. He's the father of lies, and, and far too often God's people believe the lies that Satan throws our way, and that paralyzes them in fear. Listen, discouragement is a seed planted by the devil, but watered by you. And if you water that seed, it's going to grow up into a tree. And you don't have to climb that tree. But can I tell you that God is the great encourager? Amen. Encouragement will enable and energize you. The same idea is found in Ephesians 6.10. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul understood. He knew where the power would come from. He knew in and of himself there was no power. Just like Satan will use people and circumstances, you know God will use people and circumstances to encourage you. I think of one man in my life that's a great encourager. Great encourager. His name's Chuck Craig. If you guys know him, he's right there. Chuck Craig is probably one of the greatest encouragers I know. We share the same office together, and a lot of times, can I tell you, ministry is not always the 
roses and, 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 you know, stuff that you might think it is. It gets tough sometimes because you're dealing with people and people have problems and, and we're all sinners. And so there's, there's always something. But, you know, I'll have a bad day or something like that. Chuck will come over while I'm gone to use the bathroom or something. He'll put a sticky note on my computer screen, man. Let's go. Stay at it. Get mo. And I appreciate that about Chuck. And, you know, but God uses people like Chuck and others. There's many others that are encouraged. I think it's Sid. He's a great encourager as well. But there's, there's people out there that God uses to encourage us. He uses faith and hope in his promises to encourage his children. Are you resting in God's promises today? Have you heard God's promises in his word and trusted them? What can I tell you about trusting in God's promises and encouraging yourself in the Lord? Is grab hold and don't let go. Grab hold and don't let go. He's got you if you just let him have you. Amen? Many times we give up because we trust in the wrong things to give us strength, don't we? Don't we look in the wrong direction sometimes? God is the only one that we need to go to. Look with me in verse number 7 and 8. He says, And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought, the, brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord. David inquired at the Lord. David's actions to Abiathar proved that David understood his inability to take care of his problem. So he went to God. He knew where to go for the enablement and energy. He went to God. Go, go to God in prayer. Folks, go to God in his word. Claim the promise that you need for your situation that is at hand. Grab a hold of it and don't let go. God has something for you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. The battle isn't over until it's over. Secondly, you encourage yourself in the Lord, but you also got to pursue what's been stolen. If you're going to do something about it, you got to start pursuing Look at me in verse uh, 8 again. He says, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I pursue? David went to the Lord and asked for some specific direction. You know what God's direction was? Pursue. Pursue. doesn't matter what David had done in his life prior to this point, getting him to this point. You know what, immediately, God did not say, oh, well, I don't know, maybe if you give me five Hail Marys and, man, if you pay me whatever, then I'll give you my answer. You know what he did? David inquired of the Lord what he should do. He realized that he messed up, and God didn't say, hey, no, you've messed up too far. You know what? One word, pursue. Go. I believe that's what God's calling us to do. You can't sit still. In this fight, you got to get moving. You got to get moving. You might be bruised, but listen, you're not destroyed. You have the power of the Holy Ghost over your life if you trust it. We're called to pursue, we're also called to get moving, we're called to understand your enemy. I find it interesting back in uh, verse number 8 that David didn't even know who it was that he was uh, supposed to pursue. David simply just refers to them uh, as this troop. But verse 11, you look with me there, David finds a servant and he finds out who raids his city. It says, and they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. And he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. With fire. It's at this moment that David realizes who the enemy is that he's looking for. 
Now we had an understanding of who his enemy was. I want to ask you, who's the enemy in your fight? Who is it you're up against? Who is it that's taken what's important to you captive? I believe there's two. The first answer, you. You. See, just like David, we have a flesh that lives inside of us that controls us a lot of times. Paul said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And listen, can I tell you that when you're resting in your flesh, when you're trusting in your flesh to help get you through things, you're trusting in the wrong thing. It's an enemy. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is what gets us into trouble. David made that poor decision back in 1 Samuel 27. And that poor decision led to 600 families being destroyed. And our flesh gets in the way of becoming what the Spirit of God is trying to accomplish in our lives. And David had to make a choice. He was either going to trust God or he was going to trust his heart. Listen, you have to pursue in the spirit so that you won't flee in the flesh. Pursue in the spirit. Go on in the power of the Holy Ghost, not in the power of the Holy You. Because listen, you got yourself to this point. You're your own worst enemy. You're the one that just makes the decisions, okay? Satan is coming along. He's the second enemy. He's the one that discourages. He's the one that dangles things in front of your face to make them look good. It's your flesh that makes the decision to follow what Satan tells you to do. You have a responsibility, child of God, to make the decisions based on what the Holy Spirit calls you to do and not what the Holy You calls you to do. It doesn't work that way. Anything good that you will ever do in your life comes because God is already working in you that good thing. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And when we are trusting in our own self, we are not doing God's good pleasure. We're doing our own pleasure. We're doing what pleases us. And what pleases us always ends in defeat It always brings us to our knees. It always brings us to a point where we have to look up and beg God for the encouragement that we need to pursue the enemies in our life, and that's where we are. I don't know where you are today. I've been there, man. I've been there. I made some bad decisions in my life. And I'm not talking before I was saved. Yeah, of course. But I'm talking even as a Christian made some bad decisions that affected my family, that affected my health, that affected my church. I'm thankful that I can turn to God, and we can turn to God to fight the enemy for us. The Bible says that Satan, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You know what? That's a... That's a, that denotes a, a, a very weak Christian. You see, just like a lion is out in the, in the, in the, in the plains, I don't forget what you call this. I don't know what you call them things out there. What do they call them? They're not the plains, but they're not fields. Savannah, right? Right? Is that what it is? Did I say it right? Okay. Savannah. They're out there, but you know what they do? They, they lie in wait, and they're looking whom they can devour. And they don't go for the strong ones because, you know what, it's hot in Africa, and I'd be just like them. I ain't going to be running if I don't have to. So they're going to pick out the weak ones. They're going to pick out the ones that stray from the, from the herd. He's just looking. He's looking for somebody, maybe just like you. 
far from God. He's going to eat you up. He wants to eat you up. He's always hungry. He's a 24-7 devil, and you can't beat a 24-7 devil by being a part-time Christian. It's not going to work. He's too good. He's too good. you got to stay at it. Pursue what's been stolen. If you need to repent, repent. But you can't pursue something sitting down, so you got to get up and you got to get moving. So in order to take back what the enemy stole from you, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. you got to claim a promise from his word, then pursue what's been stolen from you. But it doesn't stop there. Look with me in verse number 8 again. The Bible says, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Third thing you need to do is overtake and recover. Look at verse 16. He says, And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines, and out of the land of Judah. I can imagine David standing there. His blood starting to boil in his veins. As he stares at this vast expanse of land filled with the enemies that had burned his city and taken everything from him. And I can just see David standing there. I can see his men behind him. There's 400 of them at this point. 200 of them. We're too weak to go with him. So it's David and 400. And the Malachites are there, and all they're doing is enjoying everything that they robbed from David and all the other lands. They're eating, they're drinking, they're dancing, they're, they're celebrating the victory over David and his men, or so they thought. Little did the enemy know that David and his men were standing there watching them with fire in their veins and courage in their hearts. Little did they know that the promise of God was working against them at this very moment. Let me tell you, as you stand there, overlooking the valley full of enemies, as you stand there, looking down at the enemy of your life, parading and gallivanting down the street with everything that is important to you, Everything that you hold dear in your life, in his hand, laughing and dancing around like he's won the war. Just know that you have the power and the promise of God working behind you on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Now, just like David was sent with the promise of overtaking the enemy, God is saying to you, Overtake. Look at verse number 17. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. I believe David wrote about this experience in Psalm chapter um, 18. He said, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. David says this, For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Can I tell you that with the power and promise of God, David was able to overtake and consume his enemies? But now there's only one thing left to do. Look with me in verse number 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither son nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David, what? Last two words. Recovered all. You see, back in verse number 8, God made David a promise. David asked him, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake? 
God said, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And I find it very interesting. David didn't ask him if he was going to recover anything. God went a little step further and promised that he was going to recover all. I love the fact that now we have the opportunity to take it all back. We get the opportunity, resting in God's power, God's promises, encouraged by the Lord to take back everything that the enemy stole from us. That's guaranteed success. Did you know that? When God promises you something, he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. God's promises are yes and amen. There's nothing that God ever promised that hasn't already come to pass or that won't come to pass. God is a God of his word. Unlike us, we can frail and lie and can't keep promises. God keeps his promises. In closing, can I tell you that that word is for you today? Sometimes it may take a while. You see, it took almost an entire day from twilight till the evening of the next day for David to slaughter all of the enemy. That's a long time. That's a long battle. I don't know what it is in your life that you're battling. It might be something that's going to take a little while for you to take back. But you got to trust God. You got to trust that promise. He tells you you can overtake. You can overtake. He tells you you're going to recover all. Can I promise you you're going to recover all? Don't give up. You got to keep fighting. Your families are worth it. Your mental health is worth it. Your physical health is worth it. You got to keep fighting. You got to keep trusting. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Grab a hold of God. Don't let go. Get in his word. Claim a promise. Pursue what's been stolen. Get moving. Repent of the apathy that come to your life. And pursue in the spirit rather than fleeing in fear. And when God finally shows you who that enemy is, it might be you. It might be Satan. Overtake and recover. And you need to take it all back. For God's honor and for God's glory. You know, you can have the victory. You can have the victory. The wonderful thing is 2,000 years ago, a victory was won on the cross. Jesus came down from heaven, the holy son of God, sinless in everything that he ever did. Went to a cross, rejected by the ones he came to save. Bled for you, bled for me, and his blood paid the ultimate price for your salvation and for mine. And if we'll trust that today, we'll have the victory laid out for us. We can trust in a God that has made us overcomers. Amen? And more than conquerors through him that loved us. Experience the victory today. Head bowed, eye closed. don't know what the enemy has stolen from you. We really didn't talk about a whole lot of things, but I wonder if the enemy's stolen your joy. I wonder if the enemy's stolen confidence in, in God. Maybe the enemy's stolen parts of your family. Maybe you have a child that's wayward. Maybe you have lost loved ones. Maybe the enemy has stolen your purity. Young people. Maybe it's your physical health, your mental health. Maybe it's your finances. 
Maybe it's the knowledge of the truth of God's word that he loves you and keeps his promises. Maybe it's your identity in Christ. 